I'm Paul Newman. I'm the Museum Collections and Operations Manager here for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, based here at Anderson House uh, on Massachusetts Avenue. Um, so, so what you've got is one of the grandest homes in Washington, D.C. Our home was actually the largest private home when it was completed in 1905. Um, home, well, I say home, but home for just about 12 weeks a year to Lars and Isabel Anderson. Um, so that, henceforth, this house has become known as Anderson House. Uh, the house is uh, it encompasses 95 individual rooms, 45,000 square feet, this home. And it's very much a window into the wider neighborhood of DuPont Circle, except this is quite an extraordinary example, but this is uh, in keeping with this idea of the elites of the United States, especially DC, wanting to inhabit um, some very large homes to impress and showcase their lives to their friends, uh, potential friends, business associates. Uh, and so the Andersons, uh, like their peers, are wanting to live in DC when, it, when Congress is in session, to overlap with Congress in what they called the season, which was typically late winter into the spring, these 12 weeks a year. Um, where we are now is in the East Stair Hall. Uh, this is where we introduce, uh, as well as the Andersons, but I introduce to you to what the house has been used for and by s since the late 1930s, and that is we are the headquarters internationally of the Society of the Cincinnati. The society itself, you might think, well, why does a city in Ohio have a building in D.C.? Uh, well, the city in Ohio, Cincinnati, was named after this organization. This organization, actually on Saturday, will celebrate its 240th birthday. It's one of the oldest entities in the United States. It was formed May 13, 1783, by officers of the American and French militaries, right at the very tail end of the Revolutionary War actually about six months before it ended with the Treaty of Paris. The name Cincinnati is plural of this man's name, Lucius Quintus Cincinnatus. He was someone that in the 450s BC, almost 500 years before Christ, is called up by the Roman Senate, given dictatorial powers, which means he's made dictator, he's given absolute power to do a specific task and in his case, it was to defeat an enemy of Rome. He wins the battle and goes home. Doesn't seek greater power or riches, simply vacates his post. After his time, his name becomes synonymous with this notion of giving back power, doing your duty and nothing more. By the time of the American Revolution, the officers of the Continental Army and Navy are comparing themselves to this man's story this notion of they themselves wanting to do their duty and give back power to the people, in this case their representatives, so they call themselves Cincinnati. So today we have about 4,500 members that reside in 23 countries, and all of those members are descendants of someone that fought in the revolution, be they uh, American or French, and in, there are some uh, other cases as well, but primarily they're either American or the paintings we have in here are all the past heads of our society. The head of our society is known as President General. The very first was someone that I'm sure most people are familiar with, George Washington. So George Washington himself was our first effectively chairman of the board. That's what our President General is, the chairman of the board. Uh, originally it was a position for life. George Washington held this post until his death in 1799. Then it was handed over to um, one of the great names in American history, Alexander Hamilton. He was our second. Unfortunately, he had his untimely demise at the hand of Aaron Burr, who was also a member of our society. Uh, the painting here was actually owned by one of Hamilton's sons, uh, which gets to the root of what makes us quite an interesting organization and then museum is because we were formed by the men that were actually there making the history. And if they themselves didn't give us artifacts, that then often it was their children, grandchildren, and so on. So we end up amassing quite a wonderful collection with fantastic provenance. So there's two sides to our collection. We have a museum here, which I manage partly. Uh, we have about four and a half thousand objects, give or take, in the museum collection, which is things like tables and chairs that the Andersons owned, as well as 
paintings, weapons used uh, that date to the revolutionary period. Uh, and then there's a library which is in the basement of our home. We have 50,000 items down there, one of the largest library collections dedicated to the revolution anywhere. Uh, and again, open to the public just by appointment. So really, most of the house is exactly how the Andersons left it. Uh, the society, when they take over um, in 1938, really did very minimal work to this house. So some of it is exactly how they left it. In, in some cases, there's just new, new paint layers. Um, but most of what we'll see around the house, furniture included, lighting included, is exactly what the Andersons put into this house. It's what the Andersons left us. They left us almost everything. Um, and so the connection why they left us everything is Lars Anderson was a member of our society. And it was his wish that after his death, his widow Isabel would donate the house. And she mostly, uh, her main driving factor in donating it and making sure it all was successful was for it to be a basis of education. And so today, mostly what we do here at Anderson House is to perpetuate the legacy of why the original members fought in the revolution, what was it all about, what was it all for. In the Great Depression is when you get this changeover of people not maybe wanting to show their wealth in the same way they had done, maybe they couldn't afford the upkeep of these houses, and so they start being sold off to MBEs, um, as well as other organizations and private clubs, things like that. Yeah, we're the only building regularly open to the public on Embassy Row as it's known today. So we end up being that kind of representation of this style of life. So we call it the ballroom. Really, the Andersons would have known it more as a salon or a parlour. So even though it is a, 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 can be used as a ballroom, it was mostly used by the Andersons uh, as a place to get everyone together and gossip the night away. Um, so the room would have been filled with furniture, which was all a matching suites of furniture. It actually matched the piano that's original here. It's a baby grand, Steinway, so the exterior was custom made for this family. So his widow Isabel, the agreement is that she would still have a room here to use when she's in D.C. But the main house for this family was in Brookline, Massachusetts. So that's where they spent most of their year. Uh, and so she seems to stay here, keep living here on and off for maybe about a couple of years into the, the Second World War, World War II, and then she mostly then spends her remaining years in Brookline. And so she lives another 10 years and passes away in the late 40s. So what you've got is you've got the wooden beams, and in between you've got these, these lovely segments which you've got plaster decoration, so that would all be done by hand, and in, in, in the plaster would have been placed into moulds, and then someone was up there on scaffolding, putting that all up there. Um, and what you've got is, a lot of it is purely decorative, um, but then there are symbols that relate to the family's history. Um, I've mentioned already that we're the home to the society, and the, the Andersons decided to incorporate our symbol, the eagle of the society, right in the centre there. And that eagle was actually designed by the same man that would later on design this city, Pierre L'Enfant. So the room itself is, is a faithful recreation of a interior of a palace in Italy. And it's a really nice example of what the family are trying to do with the entire building. They're blending in the art and architecture that they most enjoy. They are passionate globetrotters. They travel through about 55 countries and territories in their lifetime which was roughly 40% of all the, the countries and territories that existed in their day. So you've got Japanese silk screens up here that are 17th century. So they're hand-painted designs on silk. There's some cityscapes of Kyoto, and then some characters and scenes from a, tale, a story called The Tale of, of Haiki, which was an 11th, 12th century story from Japan. So what we've got here, this is the Anderson Library. Um, now this table wouldn't have been here originally. This is where today our leadership of the society and our American Revolution Institute have meetings. Um, but what you've got, this is where the Andersons themselves would use these desks. We know for sure that this big, big desk over here was Lars's desk. This is where they would have been writing letters, reading books. Uh, the books themselves on the shelves are their book collection. If you ever want to understand somebody, understand what they read. 
or in this case red. So there's lots of lovely fiction with the likes of Thackeray, we've got Edgar Allan Poe, plenty of non-fiction of course, which really ties into what the family are trying to do in this house, where you've got books on the history of Rome, Greece, if they're wanting to understand how different countries' governments worked, and something we'll talk more about is that Lars Anderson was an American diplomat based across the world. This is a modern facsimile of the founding document of our society of the Cincinnati. So this is a faithful recreation. The original, it was handwritten on vellum, which is deerskin, and it breaks down what we are about, are about as an organization. We call it the institution. And then it was hand signed by George Washington through to the likes of Benjamin Lincoln. You've got Von Steuben, Henry Knox, uh, through to many different commanding officers of Continental Line regiments. Welcome to another edition of Collections Corner. I am Ellen McAllister Clark, Library Director for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. As we mark the 239th anniversary of the establishment of the Society of the Cincinnati, I am honored to present our founding document, the Institution. On May 13, 1783, a group of soon-to-be veteran officers of the Continental Army gathered at Mount Gulian, General Steuben's headquarters across the Hudson River from Newburgh, to finalize and adopt the institution that formally established the Society of the Cincinnati. Their purpose was to perpetuate the memory of the achievement of American independence, to cement their bonds of friendship formed over the eight long years of war, and to provide support for their fellow officers and families in need. Within a week of their meeting, a copy of the text of the institution was engrossed on a large sheet of parchment. A committee of three officers, Generals Steuben, William Heath, and Henry Knox, was appointed to deliver the institution to General Washington and request him to honor the society by placing his name at the head of it. Washington signed the institution first, and his signature is followed by those of the several officers in and around Newburgh who were involved in the society's founding in the late spring of 1783. The institution lays out the tenets and organizational structure of the society, the rules of eligibility to membership, the establishment of the constituent societies, including the French branch, and the details of the society's insignia. To join the society, the original members were required to sign their names to the institution, thus pledging their allegiance to the immutable principles upon which the society was founded. The institution remains the principal guiding document of our organization to the present day, and the original copy signed by George Washington is the most treasured document in the Society's archives. Portraiture is one of our great strengths. So these are all original, either 18th or 19th century paintings. Um, we've curated a particular kind of cross-section here we have people like uh, the great grand Marquis de Saint-Simon, who's a Frenchman. He's wearing his Society Eagle as a member of our organization. He uh, was most prominently involved at the Siege of Yorktown, where he commanded about 3,000 French troops. In America, no one really can compete with John Trumbull. Um, he's most known for his great paintings in the rotunda of the US Capitol. And we're very lucky to have this John Trumbull original portrait on loan to us from our New York Society, and this is depicting Sergeant Brian Rossiter, who fought in the American Revolution. The namesake of our house, and our direct connection to why we're talking about the American Revolution in the middle of a Gilded Age mansion, is this man, this is Richard Anderson. He's the great-grandfather of Lars Anderson, who owned this house with his wife Isabel. Uh, this man serves throughout the Revolutionary War he personally knew Lafayette, he was one of his aides, and after the war gets the job to distribute land grants in the Ohio Territory, which is how he starts amassing a, a, a fortune, effectively, which helps to build this house. Now, this is simply one of the most charming spaces in the whole house. Um, this is our conservatory, it's known as the Winter Garden. So it's pretty empty today, but in the heyday of the Andersons, this would have been filled to the rafters with flowers. Uh, and tables and chairs would have been kind of intermingled. Uh, where we're standing right now is the breakfast room of the family. These were their breakfast chairs. They would have a big round table in the center here. 
Um, now, I mentioned earlier that they, they live most of their year in Brookline, Massachusetts. And if they missed home, then they had their gardens with them here. These are hand-painted murals from the very early 20th century, depicting in the Italian gardens that the family had up at Weld in Brookline. Weld was the name of the estate, W-E-L-D, that was her, um, her mother's family's name. And that, that's where Isabel's family makes their money, the Welds make their money in the Boston area in shipping out of New England. So when you get vents like this, these lovely brass vents, this is the original heating system, some of which is still being used. So the house was built with central heating and electricity. The garden has changed somewhat, but there's still some lovely original features. So originally this uh, reflecting pool wouldn't have been here, uh, but the magnolias are original. We've got a lot of antiquities out here that the family collected. The Buddhist statue, however, would have originally been in the entrance hall. The first thing you would have seen when you came in this house would have been that. Uh, but the society moved, moved this out in at least the third, late 30s, maybe 40s, they relocated it out here. Originally though, the, the land that the family owned went to P Street, which is probably a couple of hundred yards that way. They had a tennis court the other side of this wall, and where today there's the Royal Sinesta Hotel, that was where the carriage house was of this house. I love the back, it's a little bit more palatial, more character I think. You've got these lovely urns on the top. Um, and it's easier to see the scale of the building. We'll be looking at the first two floors. The third floor were the bedrooms, and actually still are. Members of our society can stay in the bedrooms, which are largely original. If you have a shower in what's called today the Virginia Suite, you're using Lars Anderson's shower, which is original. Um, Lars and Isabel both had suites of rooms on the third floor, and then guest bedrooms, servant bedrooms. Yeah. And then, then we have a fourth floor, which where I'm based, is where we have the storage of the museum, which was originally where the family stored things. There are servant bedrooms up there that are now staff offices. They even did some of the laundry up there originally. And down at this end, we have a lovely nod to Washington, D.C. These are driving murals of Washington, D.C. that were painted in about 1910. And that's because this family were car crazy. Absolutely car crazy, and that's both he and her. This is Lars and Isabel in one of their automobiles. This one's right-hand drive. And what you've got is DC and Georgetown. Uh, you're looking into Maryland. And the red are their favorite driving routes in the city. And then they've marked on their landmarks, which are landmarks that we still would visit today if we're in DC. You've got a big giraffe here. That's the National Zoo. Up Massachusetts Avenue, this is the Naval Observatory where the Vice President today has their residence. Uh, we've got over here, this is the Lincoln Cottage where we have the old soldier's home, Rock Creek Park. And then this little white building is us. And these are hand painted on canvas. Carriage House that's now the Car Museum in Brookline, they have 15 of the family's cars. They're all in original condition. Um, they would name the cars individually and so you can chart that journey and they had little, little symbols on all the doors that for each car individually. Um, they actually have Isabel's electric car from 1908 that she drove around in. She was the first woman in Massachusetts to get a driving license. The painting up top here, this is Isabel and Lars. Uh, this is from about 1926, this painting. Lars is wearing his eagle as a member of our society. Isabel getting into the heart of what kind of lady she was, she's wearing her war medals because she volunteers as a nurse with the Red Cross and is sent to the Western Front in World War I. So we are gonna head up our floating staircase. And if you wondered how it floats, it's because this house has a couple of secrets. The house is built with a steel frame and there's steel beams connecting all these treads here, these steps into the main frame of the house. When this house was constructed, it was constructed with in mind to have this specific layout so that the guests are taken on a circuit and they're getting a, all these treats uh, and kind of the, these experiences. You're going 18th century France to 16th century England and then you've got the dining room here. And so this is the original dining table, the original dining chairs. Everything in here is original bar some air conditioning units that are kind of discreet to one side. Um, but this is the same table and chairs that at least two presidents of the United States came to dinner. 
that were looking at people like Taft and Coolidge. Taft was a family friend and actually lived on this street as well. Uh, Alice Roosevelt, daughter of Teddy, would marry into this family and she was coming here to dinner. She also lived on this street. Her house is still standing actually. Um, so this is the epicenter of everything. The whole point of this house is to network. And this is where it's happening. Now they would sit in the British style, which meant the head of the table was here. So you'd have Lars here, Isabel across the way, and then the honored guests would be to their immediate right. And while you're having dinner, you can look upon these tapestries, which at the latest, they date to about 1625. They are Flemish. These particularly were made in Brussels by two different workshops and commissioned by King Louis XIII for France. We've got eight of them all together and they have been conserved, but just the conservation of the tapestries took about nine years. And one of the things we do as a museum is because we, we're trying to show it as a house, so it's a balancing act of like the light that comes in. We do have UV filters on windows to mitigate the light that would come in and damage textiles, but it, it's still a balance. Lars is from about 1908, painted by a Spanish artist called Jose Viegas. But then once again, his wife steals the show, painted by Cecilia Bow. It's very much the epitome of female fashion at the time. She's wearing a dress that was maybe made for her in Paris. She certainly had a number of dresses made for her in Paris. But it's something we haven't really talked about is what it took to make this house tick. There was about 20 servants, give or take, that lived and worked here. Um, in every room, sometimes twice in a room, there's buttons like this. That, that's how the Andersons would call down to the servants. So one button would go down to the footman, one to the servants hall. Uh, the buttons are mother of pearl because, because they could. Um, but through here, we've got what we call the serving pantry. So a room that uh, the servants would have known very well. We have a natural rubber floor. That's the original floor from 1905. It's hard wearing, it's easy to clean helps soundproof the space. Uh, and what you've got in here are some of the serving where the family would have been uh, dining from and the drawers and cupboards would have been filled to the brim with everything they needed for a dinner party. It begins here, these, these lovely gold rimmed plates and, and bowls and cups. This is Minton China from the UK. Uh, the family's cipher is on every single plate. Here we have a silver set that the family owned. Each one again has the family's, in this case, just initial, the A. But they also incorporated the society of the Cincinnati. They have the eagle on every plate as well. So a gallery such as this is where you show your collections. Uh, here we benefit from all the natural daylight coming in. This is where guests would promenade from one wing of the house to the other to head through to the dining room. And where we'll be going are the drawing rooms where the family would first meet with their guests. They're handing out cocktails, so they have a small cocktail reception. Uh, and in here you've got a host of, of objects from east meets west. More tapestries from that same collection continue through here. We've got altarpieces from Spain that are 16th century hand-carved in wood, gilded and painted, various scenes from the life of Jesus Christ. The coat there is part of Lars's diplomatic uniform. He had that made in London for his posting to Belgium. This is a hidden door. Uh, it doesn't open, it can do, but we have it locked from the other side. But this piece that's been pushed in this is actually a button that would open up this door and it's a fire escape from Lars's bedroom on the next floor down to this level because inside there's no staircase that takes you from top to bottom on this end of the house. For this generation, they're coming, they're existing in the wake of the great fire in Chicago. After that, if you've got money, you're doing everything you can to fireproof your house. So this, this building has a steel frame. It's also got terracotta arches in, in the inside that make this building very, very fire resistant. Mm. We're coming into the drawing room portion of the house. So there's two drawing rooms, this inspired by 18th century France. All of this gilt decoration is either paper mache, put into molds or plaster, again, put into molds and then gilded. So this is the gilding is all done by hand, painstaking work. They've used very small brushes to hand apply it on. 
The diploma is a facsimile of our membership diplomas, another badge of membership. And then the dinner plate happens to be George Washington's dinner plate. Well, one of his dinner plates, I should say. He had 300 pieces that made up a society-inspired uh, dining set, uh, each with our eagle painted on. They, they were handmade, hand-painted in China. And the other half of our drawing room space here is known as the English drawing room. It could also double up as a sitting room, which is how we're showing the room at the moment. This wonderful large window looking out to the back garden. And this is Isabel. Isabel in 1920, when she's about 40, with her parrot whose name was Anna. And she loved birds, especially parrots. Birds will crop up in all sorts of uh, different ways, be they porcelain or painted in on the walls. So this is really, I, I mentioned that this house is a great best kept secret in DC. This room is one of the best kept secrets in DC. It's something right out of the Capitol building or the Library of Congress. Uh, this, I remember, was a private home originally. And this is the reception room. This is where the Andersons are greeting you. And what you've got is the story of their family on the walls and on the ceiling, all hand painted. The walls are actually canvas, hand-painted, and then the ceiling's plaster that's hand-painted. Um, but it's dominated this room by these four murals, painted by a man called Henry Siddons Mowbray, who today is most famous for his work that decorates the Morgan Library. It begins here with this scene, busy scene, of a host of officers watching as the Marquis de Lafayette, America's favorite Frenchman, is made a member of our society with George Washington handing him a membership diploma or certificate. And then watching on is this man who's Lars's great grandfather. So he's able to say, My great grandfather was there at the end of the revolution. And behind us, we then fast forward to the 1860s and the Civil War, which both on Isabel and Lars's sides of the family, both their parents, their fathers, fight in the Civil War with the Union, one in the Navy, one in the Army. But this scene is dominated by allegorical women, this idea that you're using women to represent other values or ideas. The woman with the shield is to represent the Union. The woman holding cotton in her right arm is the South. And the, at the end, the winged figure with the helmet there and the flaming torch is war. So it's trying to show that the North is trying to stop the South going to war as they overlook the first battle of the Civil War and the firing on Fort Sumter. Not only that though, that is where Lars's great uncle, Major Robert Anderson, will command Fort Sumter and be on the receiving end of the first shots of the Civil War. So this house again, I, I mentioned, it takes you on a journey, it takes you on a circuit. Um, it's very much theatre in architecture. This is the main staircase to get the guests from the lower floor up to the second floor. And as they're coming up, they get presented with one of the biggest paintings you'll see in a private home in Washington DC, what we call the Triumph of the Dogeressa. Painted over the course of 10 years by Spanish artist Jose Villegas, finished in 1892, and I mentioned it's called the Triumph of the Dogeressa. The Dogeressa is Maria Foscari in the gold outfit, way in the back. She's being ushered forward, led by her ladies-in-waiting who are boarding this vessel, and it's meant to be that we're joining, about to join them on the vessel, and the man in the robes is Maria's husband, the Dogeressa of Venice, so the leader of Venice. And the story is that they're leaving their palace and they're getting aboard his vessel to go up one of the canals in Venice to head to the Doge's palace, their new royal residence. One of the few remaining American-made guns, that's what we call the six-pounder. All the walls are hand-painted with what we call trompe l'oeil, tricking the eye, uh, painted about 1909 with these very Greco-Roman motifs, as well as symbols. 
that relate to the family. So you've got the eagle of the society, you've got weapons to represent the military heritage of the family, and then you've got an ambassador's box, which uh, was something to relate to the fact that when you became an ambassador, you might have something like this to keep your pens and inks. Um, and Lars Anderson's great ambition was to become an ambassador, and in 1913, he's appointed US ambassador to Japan by William Taft. Right now, our exhibition is called Affairs of State, and it's the history of political and diplomatic entertaining here at the house from 1905 through to today. The State Department have used this house for many different events. Uh, we've had royalty stay in the house. So Winston Churchill was here, President Reagan was here, Charles de Gaulle of France was here. And everything, bar a couple of things, uh, are from our collection. So we have Lars's full diplomatic uniform, his hat, his sword. We have pieces from our, our, our showing our table settings, um, our seating plan from one particular dinner of April 1915, of where everybody was sitting, including the vice president at the time. We have the story of public service in the Andersons, some of the medals they were awarded. We have the, the actual ambassador's box that Lars owned, which is made of silver. The building was used by the US Navy for the majority of World War II. So we talk about some of that, including the fact that the Sullivan brothers, their parents received posthumously the five boys purple hearts here in Anderson House. And we've got the two known to still exist on loan to us from the granddaughter of Albert Sullivan, who perished aboard the Juno with his four brothers. Can we go through how the society took ownership of this house, through to this story of world leaders coming here for dinner parties and to be entertained by the United States. So this, the guests were coming this way. This is the first room you see coming here for a dinner party. So it's again the theatre that the Andersons are wanting to build in. And what you've got is a choir stall here from a church or cathedral in Italy. It's 17th century in date. This would have been handmade, handcrafted, purely for a decorative piece in this house. So the guests are coming this way. They're seeing this. They're understanding that this family are educated. They're interested in, in art and architecture from around the globe. And then above you is effectively the resume of this family. There's 22 different symbols relating to public service, their education, medals they were awarded, certain things you have uh, in terms of education. You've got this red shield that appears several times with the books. That's the symbol of Harvard University. And you have the graduating year of a particular member of the family. So this is how they tell their guests. If you, if you came here for a party, didn't know the Andersons, you come in here and then you're starting to understand what the family is about and their, their lineage, their heritage, and then what the Andersons were doing at that moment. Some of these were oil lamps originally, but then the family electrified. So often the light bulbs are really sticking out because they're trying to show, yes, we're bringing the past to the modernity and we're using the new technologies. This is your lobby here. So this is where the guests are going, and it says, through this door, come and welcome be our friends and guests most cordially. Whereas on this side, for the family, it says, through this door, come and welcome be all who share part in the family. So this is the Society of the Cincinnati's flag, uh, based from an early American flag known as the Battle Flag. It has the Society's Eagle with 13 stars for the 13 first states. And then you've got alternating blue and white um, stripes. The blue is to represent the United States. The white is to represent France, because those two countries together make the society of the Cincinnati.